Hi, my name is Jeroen and I'm here today with my colleague Ishan. We are going to talk to you about how we are using the Ray Software Suite to generate or create an enterprise scale reinforcement learning solution. In today's talk, we are going to cover the problem statement. So why do we need such a solution? Why do, and how does the DeepSame platform enable that? And then more importantly, how does Ray integrate with that and how do we use RLib and Tune? Finally, Ishan will cover two demos that show how this, how this product is used in practice. So with today's technology becoming increasingly more complex, it becomes more and more important that the software that controls those systems is up to par. And that's really difficult because the number of sensors and actuators that these modern day technologies require is growing exponentially. This is so complex that humans can't easily program this software anymore, let us alone understand it, because the number of parameters is, uh, is way too complex for them to follow. And therefore, we need another solution. And in this case, that's a reinforcement learning powered controller. And what the DeepSim platform does, it gives the power of reinforcement learning into the hands of subject matter experts. The subject matter experts know everything about their problem, be it drones or smart grids or manufacturing or uh, electrification, but they might not know anything about reinforcement learning. And that's why, but they still want to take advantage of products like Ray and Tune and RLib. But with our tool, our platform, they can do that without being the experts in reinforcement learning. So what is a controller and how, how can that be used with uh, neural networks? A controller takes an input or an observation and in traditional controllers, that can be a set of PID controllers. These then use heuristics and lookup tables to determine what action should be taken. And these actions are then sent forward to the actuators, which the process then takes and that results in an output. That output and the process also give feedback, which results in a feedback loop. So that the next, next clock tick or next event, the PID controller gets new observations and takes new actions. Now, a reinforcement learning controller works very similar, but instead of having a PID controller, you have a neural network or also called an RL agent in, in the loop. So you take your input or your observations you pass them through the neural network and out come a set of actions that will be taken. Now, to train this neural network, you can use the actual hardware, but in general, that's not very scalable nor very advised. For example, if you want to train a self-driving car, you don't want to do that from scratch on the highway. Instead, you want to have that run in software simulations, digital twins, like our, where you can reproduce all the environments and events that actually happen in real life, including collisions, rain, snow, traffic jams, etc. And by doing this in the computer, you can scale it up using cloud computing so that a lot of these scenarios are trained in parallel, causing your controller to be ready for any event in real life. And these controllers will then be able to handle a large amount of inputs and outputs which is more complex than what humans can handle. Now, how does that work? If we look at our DeepSend platform, we see a number of well-known components. These are the red boxes. So RLib, Ray, but also TF agents or Horopod. These are complex components that the average uh, user might not be familiar with in, in their general day-to-day -day work. And that's why most of our users use a simple to use front end, which can be a Python interface or a web interface. And then using that front end, they can com get control of all the features and capabilities that the Ray software stack offers. 
And all of this will then be running on the public cloud in order to generate and take advantage of large scale training runs. In this talk, we will focus solely on the Ray software stack. And in this, in this slide, we can see how the Ray software stack binds everything together. So on top of our Lib and Tune, we've built a number of tools and a number of standard features that the user can select from, such as a set of custom action distributions or custom neural network models. Typically, these are models that are commonly used within the fields of our customers. Now, what's more, you can also define your own neural network using a set of easy to use configuration files. That way, the user doesn't have to know Python, Keras, or TensorFlow. Instead, you just define in text what type of network you're looking for, and the software will turn that into a custom RLLib model. This is combined with a set of custom logging functions that allow you to get easy access into the events and metrics that are produced by RLLib, but also by your simulators. That way, you can keep track of your training run and decide if it's going the right way or not. Uh, later in this talk, Ishan will show a couple of examples of this. And then you can use the analysis tools to inspect that. They also give you suggestions on what to do to improve your training progress. So both in terms of stability, but also explorability. Maybe you need more scenarios in order to make your controller more general and more robust. Now, all this is used for training and training is great. But if you can't deploy your trained model, everything you did so far is useless. So probably just as important is your inference pipeline in your, in, in your deployment software. So, and that's where the export methods and inference methods come into play, which take the, the model that has been trained with RLLib and prepare it to be used and deployed on the actual hardware. The standard workflow then becomes as follows. The user configures the simulation software, selects a reward function, maybe writes a reward function in order to have the controller do what you want it to do and get you the result you're looking for. All of this is packaged and sent to the, to the run management system, which then converts these configurations and settings into runs that can be used with Tune. This is combined with HPO and NOS in order to explore a large amount of parameters and possible configurations, all automatically, such that the user doesn't have to be a machine learning expert. We just let the computer handle all these complexities by throwing more compute at it. Once all the runs are configured, they are sent to the scalable RAID cluster and the training is started. During the training, the user can hook up things like TensorBoard or CLI output in order to keep track of the progress. This allows them to decide if the training is doing what they want. You can interrupt the training, but you can also, of course, decide, oh, the training is going this and this. Let's add a couple more runs, which will then be queued and deployed on the scalable cluster. Finally, when the training is complete, you export the trained agent in order to deploy it. And the deployment, the type of deployment really depends on the target application and the target hardware. For example, if you're doing a manufacturing style controller, then latency is usually not that big of a problem. It can be a few seconds without problem. In that case, you can use Serve in order to generate and create a cloud-based API. There might be not so much optimization needed because the cloud has enough compute and uh, compute power available to serve your request within reasonable time. On the other end of the spectrum, you might want to deploy it on devices that require milliseconds based responses. For example, if your drone detects a tree, you want to know if you should stare left or right before you actually hit the tree. In that case, what we have to do is we have to optimize the train checkpoint for the particular embedded hardware. For example, that can be done using Onyx or TensorRT. Especially TensorRT is useful if you use, for example, the NVIDIA Drive hardware, 
where you want to take advantage of GPU-based uh, execution. Our optimizers and inference library handle all of that for you. And then finally, there can also be an in-between step where performance might not be the issue, but regulatory requirements might require you to have a system that's not connected to the internet. So at that point, you can't use a cloud-based API, but instead you can deploy it using a standard laptop or workstation, which is then connected directly to, for example, your smart grid or your wind farm. And with this, we've covered all the steps that are executed, so training, configuration, deployment. And with that, I hand it over to Ishan, who will show two demos that do all these steps and we see how it works in practice. Thank you. Thanks, Yeru. Hello, everyone. I'm Ishan Sood. So, so far, we have seen DeepSim and its features. Now we look at some of these features in actions through a couple of use cases. The first use case is designing the energy management system of a hybrid electric vehicle. For this, we are using a, an open source simulator called FastSim. It has been developed by National Renewable Energy Lab and we modified it to support the Python-based OpenAI gym interface. Now the job of the controller in an HEV is to switch uh, the split the power demand between the electric motor and the IC engine. Now this can be a rule-based controller which has uh, most of the power coming from the electric motor uh, during low speeds or when the vehicle is starting up and uh, most of the power coming from the engine when at high speeds or it can be a smart controller where we basically aim to improve the fuel efficiency without affecting the drivability of the controller. For this, we train a neural network reinforcement learning agent and uh, that agent requires input coming from the sensor and the user data such as state of charge, power demand, speed, acceleration and so on. The output is the amount of energy that, that will be used from the IC engine. So this output is between 0 and 1 where 1 means the entire energy, the entire power is coming from the IC engine and 0 means the entire power is coming from the electric motor. Now we want our uh, RL agent to be robust enough so we are going to uh, generate a lot of training scenarios or drive cycles which are variations of urban and highway drive cycles that are commonly used. And with that we are able to control, uh, we are able to train our controller. A crucial component of reinforcement learning is the design of the reward function. So here our aim is to increase the miles traveled per gallon of fuel consumed. So the idea behind designing such a reward function is to pay a penalty for consuming more, dis more fuel while the distance traveled remains the same. <clears throat> so this is how what the reward function looks like. It's the negative of the fuel consumed by the IC engine and the effective consu fuel consumed by the motor. Now the fuel consumed by the motor is of obviously depending on the charge of the battery. So it can also be negative, in which case the reward here will be entirely positive. So it becomes negative when there's regenerative braking and the charge of the battery basically increases. And this is what the reward looks like in the actual code. Uh, with this reward function, now our simulator is uh, integrated completely with the deep sim. And now we are ready to launch the training runs. To do that, we are using uh, the RLLib algorithm from the Ray library, which is the PPO algorithm. We are launching the training runs on Azure Cloud using HPv2 compute nodes. And all of the parallel multi-worker training is managed by the Ray backend. Now to launch the training run, we specify all the Ray RLLib settings as well as the DeepSim settings in a JSON file. And then we can use either a command line interface or as shown here, a Jupyter Notebook interface to launch our run. So here we are using the DeepSim command ds.launch from cloud where we specify the experiment name, the backend that we are using, which is Ray here, the verbosity if we want, and all the training, setting, training settings, the JSON file that is required for our training purpose. Once we have started a training run, we can also set up a tensor board instance in the cloud and then start a secure channel to our local machine using a ds.tensorboard command. So with that, we can always monitor, we, we can constantly monitor while the training goes on in the cloud. So here you can see a lot of experiments going on in parallel. Uh, and we can also look at interesting metrics that Tune allows us to log. Uh, so we have developed some custom metrics for this particular use case. So you can look at the miles per gallon mean value of the miles per gallon, or you can look at the action taken by our uh, agent and uh, as the training goes along. And 
interesting feature of DeepSim is it allows us to do a hyperparameter search. And for this, it utilizes Tune backend. So for example, in this use case, say we want the optimal values of the discount factor gamma and the learning rate, uh, we can simply do a grid search by choosing from discrete values of gamma and by sampling from, say, log uniform distribution over the learning rate. So all these 20 uh, odd experiments are run in parallel using the tensor board and they can be monitored using the tensor board uh, itself. So for example, here we can look at how the reward is behaving with for each of the runs and then choose the hyperparameters that gives us the best reward. So with that, our hyperparameter configuration is all set up. Now the final uh, training agent is now uh, ready and we train it for approximately six hours using six and a half million simulator steps. This whole training was carried out on Azure HPV2 compute nodes and each HPO run required four ray workers. Now to test our agent, we check it on an unseen drive cycle. So the drive cycle that you see here is the urban dynamometer drive cycle, UDDS. And the first thing we have to check is whether there's whether the agent is able to, uh, to reach the target speed. So there's no negative effect on the performance of the car itself. And hence there's no uh, artificial gain in the fuel efficiency. So if, as you can see, our agent is able to achieve that. And now we look at how the fuel efficiency, which was our major concern, how does that perform? So we are checkpointing at every 10 epochs of training and we are testing on this UDDS cycle at, or for all those epochs that we have checkpointed. And as you can see, it starts off from 55 miles per gallon, approximately. And eventually it crosses the baseline. This baseline performance is by fast sim using some heuristics. And so it crosses that baseline and eventually saturates to about 3.2% improvement over the unseen UDDS cycle above the baseline. So with this training run, our, able, our agent is able to perform better than the fast sim baseline. So you can collect more information on this by visiting our website and looking at our white paper. And there's also a YouTube movie uploaded, which you can check out. Now, it's not just the final efficiency that we are concerned about, but also how the agent behaves. So we can use deep sim visualization toolkit to look at the uh, behavior of the agent. For example, in this particular plot on the top right, uh, we see the state of charge of the battery of the agent, which is in blue, against the state of charge of the battery of the baseline agent. And as we can see, our agent is not able, not only able to perform better in terms of fuel efficiency, but also keeps a higher charge compared to the baseline. Similarly, if you look at the actions here, they correspond nicely with the UDDS drive cycle. So in regions of high acceleration, most of the energy or the power is coming from the engine. Whereas while braking and when there are low speeds, the agent tends to focus more on the electric motor. We can also generate some scatter plots. For example, in this one, we compare reward against speed for different power demand regions. So if you look at a particular speed, as the power demand goes from very high positive values to negative values, the reward improves, and which is the way we designed a reward function. So all of these plots can be generated with the help of deep sim visualization, and they can all, they're all interactive, and they can all be also exported to dynamic HTML for communication of the results. Uh, with this, let's move on to the other use case where we are designing an adaptive cruise control with an emergency braking system. So for this, we use the simulator called ANSYS VR Experience powered by Scanner. And this was integrated with our DeepSims bindings using with the help of ANSYS team. And this is what the simulator looks like. So here the aim is to develop a cruise controller, uh, which is smart. So by that, what I mean is, and if there's no car on the road, it has to behave like a normal cruise controller, maintain the stable constant speed that you want. But if there is a car on the road, it has to also maintain a safe three second distance from that car. So this is the goal of our, uh, of our agent. And for that, again, we use input coming from sensors and the user, such as current speed, distance from the car in front and the requested speed. The output here is now from minus one to one, where the negative values tell me how much fraction of the maximum braking force the agent has to apply, whereas the positive values tell the percentage of pressure on the accelerator pedal. Now this time we generate uh, scenarios again uh, for better, for more robust controller, but this time by using a VR Explorer. And we, we generated using some random starting locations, target speeds, acceleration, and braking behaviors. Once again, the reward design 
Here, the aim is to achieve the requested speed, maintain a safe distance from the lead car, and also keep the rides very smooth. So we pay a penalty for deviating from our desired speed or getting too close to the lead car. And we pay a heavy reward if, in case there is a collision with the lead car, which we certainly want to avoid. And we introduce another component for jerky ride, where jerky ride means if there are large changes in acceleration and braking. As it is commonly observed in uh, these reinforcement learning agents that they tend to switch actions too rapidly. So with that, uh, this is what the reward function finally looks like. It's a weighted sum of square of all the other components that you see here. And this is how it performs in action. So the reward is changing not only with respect to how far it is from the car, so but also with respect to the action taken. So if in case the action changes rapidly, as you can see here, there is some uh, drop in the reward values. And when the car begins, uh, when the when the scenario starts and the car comes too close to our ego car, there's a very huge negative reward until their safe distance comes into place and the reward becomes zero. Now results, uh, again, we, we use the proximal policy optimization algorithm. Uh, and this time the training took about 10 hours using 1 million simulator steps. And it was conducted on Azure Windows virtual machine where the simulator is integrated. Um, now we'll compare the results in for three different scenarios. In the first scenario, there is no lead car. So our agent has to maintain the requested speed, which you can see it starts from somewhere above the desired speed, but applies brakes and gets to a constant acceleration to maintain the requested target speed. In a second scenario, there is a lead car which keeps changing its speed. So our agent target speed also keeps changing with the same, uh, for, by the same amount and our, able, our agent is able to maintain that speed by varying the acceleration and braking behavior in the same way. In a third scenario, uh, there is a, the, the lead car has come to a stop and our agent has to perform immediate emergency braking to come to a halt and it does that by keeping and also maintains a safe distance from the lead car. Now let's see all of this deployed agent in action on the real simulator. If you look at, this is what the simulator looks like. These are the three uh, pedals here, uh, for a clutch which is unused, the brake and the gas pedal. And when there is no training, the agent does not take any action. So it, the car goes with the momentum and crashes into the lead car, which is not what we want. So after five iterations of training, the agent has learned to apply a brake and stops just before the lead car. Now after 40 iterations, when the agent has learned enough, it is able to maintain a safe distance and stops like 15 meters from the lead car. And in a different scenario, the agent is keeps changing its acceleration uh, depending on the speed by the lead car and is able to follow the lead car very smoothly. Also in uh, varying scenarios where the lead car also comes to stop in the middle, the agent is able to uh, follow that and maintain a very safe distance from the lead car. So it has generalized two very uh, different situations now. With this, we come to the end of our today's presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining in. Have a great day, Hype.